Good afternoon. It's my pleasure to be with you today to talk about the results of the research that I've done into the, the incidents that took place in Japan uh, during the period 1994-95 and the period since then to take a look at what is really the, the only real case extant right now of WMD terrorism, weapons of mass destruction terrorism, and that of course is the case of Om Shinrikyo. Today I'm going to take a look uh, basically at five different aspects of the issue. I'm going to start out by addressing, of course, the attack itself, the March 20, uh, 1995 nerve gas attack in the Tokyo subway that for many people in the world really gave them their first, first glimpse at what WMD terrorism might represent. Beyond that, though, it's important to note that the subway attack didn't happen without notice. So it's not as though it came without warning. And so we're going to take a look at some of the precursor events that led up to that attack as well. We will spend some time addressing the cult, Om Shinrikyo. And for those of you that just came in, I hope it doesn't ruin the story if I tell you that a religious group was involved in this attack. If so, you haven't been doing your reading, and shame on you. We'll take a break. We'll then come back and we'll address the technologies and agents used in the attack. Because again, this was, at least, at least by some ways, looking at it, a high technology terrorist attack. And finally, some observations, some, uh, some possibly justified surmises on my part, uh, and maybe some lessons that we can extract for future study. The timeline we're going to explore stretches from June 1994 on through the present time. We're going to make a couple of stops along the way at various places around Japan. And again, we're going to take a look not just at the Tokyo attack, but at the events that came before and the consequences of that attack as well. Let's begin by taking a look at the attack. March 20. 1995 in Tokyo. It was a Monday morning, uh, in fact rush hour, at about 8 o'clock in the morning when packages were placed on five different trains in the Tokyo subway system. Packages were punctured, they began to leak a liquid onto the floors of the trains themselves. Some of this became a gas, some of it evaporated and became a gas, a toxic agent. The critical ingredient we would learn was sarin. This was the scene that morning in Tokyo. Sarin, as most of us are aware, is one of the most toxic chemical substances known to man. It's got a very, very low lethal dosage, particularly as an aerosol. In fact, the classic definition of sarin's lethality is that a pinpoint drop, if allowed to be absorbed into bare skin, will cause death in about 15 minutes. As we've been able to reconstruct it, the plan was to attack five different trains in the Tokyo subway. Well, actually, the plan was to attack six different trains in the Tokyo subway system, but only five were attacked, all of which were converging on the center of the city. They came on the Hibiya, Chiyoda, and Marinucci lines. As a result of the attack, an attack that focused on moving towards the center of the city, moving through many stations, there were fatalities, there were injuries throughout central Tokyo. This was what it was like that morning. Initial reports came from the inner suburbs, and then as time passed, more and more stations reported injuries, ultimately cons converging at the station known as Kasuma Gaseki. Now, Kasuma Gaseki is a major station with about uh, nearly a dozen separate entrances. Obviously, it serves all three of those subway lines. It also serves a number of major government buildings. In fact, uh, it's similar to the Federal Triangle area in Washington. It serves, the, it serves the Ministry of International Trade and Industry, Ministry of Defense, Ministry of Foreign Affairs. In particular importance this morning, though, was that it also serves as the station for the National Police Agency. Now, the National Police Agency in Japan operates in a rather different uh, fashion than, than police organizations in our country. Uh, in Japan, all of the police belong to a central police force, the National Police Agency. However, each of the various prefectures, the Japanese equivalent of states, have a great deal of autonomy in their operations. So the NPA is not really a centralized command center. It's more of a coordinating 
organization, and yet it still provides a function analogous to the FBI or to Scotland Yard in Japan. In terms of the execution of the attack, there were five teams, each consisting of two men and women, uh, men or women rather. One person carried the package onto the train, plastic bags wrapped in newspaper which contained a chemical soup, again a principal ingredient of which was sarin, placed the package on the train, punctured it, used a sharpened umbrella tip actually, the agent spilled out and it began to evaporate. Now the objective of this attack, there's a great deal of speculation, ultimately we've, we have learned that the real objective of that attack was to kill as many police personnel as possible, which is one of the reasons you see the attacks converging on the National Police Agency. Why? We'll get to that a little bit later. By the end of the day, 15 different stations in the Tokyo subway system, the world's busiest subway system, had been affected. Of those, the stations along the Hibiya line, which is the oldest subway line in Tokyo, had the heaviest casualties. Some of them had 300, 400 victims. The total number of injured, just under 3,800. Some numbers, some estimates went as high as 5,500, but that number was subsequently revised downward. 1,000 of those 3,800 required hospitalization for at least 24 hours, and a significant number required hospitalization for longer periods of time. Some people received permanent injuries. And there were also 12 people either dead or dying by the end of that day. This was the scene outside of Kasuma Gaseki Station, outside of one of its entrances that morning. There are several things to notice. First of all, you can see a number of policemen in their blue uniforms. You can see members of the, of the, uh, the subway staff itself. They're noticeable by their, their green coats, their little, little French-style police caps, and their white cotton gloves, all the better to avoid soiling the suits of people who are of commuters who are getting shoved under the trains during rush hour. In the left of this picture, you can also see emergency responders, emergency personnel dealing with victims. Now, it's interesting to note that on that morning, only about 10% of the victims were actually transported by ambulances or other emergency vehicles. Fully 90% of the victims transported themselves to hospitals. They walked, they took taxis, they commandeered cars, and in some cases, they even took the subway. Now, the response was remarkable. Japanese police were on the scene in force very shortly after the attack. In fact, there are, there are reports that there were extra police on the streets in Tokyo that morning. Japan Ground Self-Defense Force chemical troops, based two hours north of Tokyo, got the call at about 11 o'clock in the morning to come to Tokyo. They were in Tokyo shortly after 1 o'clock in the afternoon. Now, that's a rather remarkable mobilization rate. In fact, the extra police on the street the very rapid response by the self-defense force, all that reflects the fact that there had been prior event planning. There had been a series of exercises the week before. In fact, 500 members of the Tokyo police force had received training in chemical gear, in chemical operations, the week before the subway attack from those self-defense forces. They had received protective chemical gear as well. And there had been tabletop exercises designed to address what to do in the event of a chemical incident. However, neither the medical nor the fire communities in Tokyo were involved in that training. Now, I recognize that there are some loose ends floating in the breeze here. We'll get back to those in a minute. Consequences of the attack, it says widespread panic there, but let's, let's, be, let's be very candid about it. You didn't have people running blindly through the streets, you know, running into lampposts with their eyes, eyes open. It wasn't panic in that sense. What you had was the full gamut of human emotions. You had fear, you had anger, you had confusion, you had uncertainty. Uh, you, had, you had everyone asking the same questions. Who did this? How could this have happened? Why did they do it? This became, in fact, a national obsession. The media in Japan, very aggressive, were on this story doggedly for months. In fact, it was very common, in fact, it was impossible uh, not to turn on the television at night and find that at least one of the five broadcast television networks was running, wasn't running a show on Aum Shinrikyo or on the attack or on its consequences. This was a story that dominated the media in Japan, uh, and it dominated the media for at least six months. There were even demands for legal changes. As noted before, a religious organization was involved in these attacks. Once that information became well known, and once it became suspected that the cult's protections under the Japanese Constitution, its freedom of religion provisions in particular, 
had enabled the cult to amass its weapons capability, there were actually calls for changing the Constitution, for eliminating some of the freedoms of religion that are enjoyed by the Japanese people. Now, ultimately, those demands were, were put to the side primarily because other religious organizations with their own para paramilitary wings were effective lobbyists against changes like that. Nonetheless, those, changes, those demands were called for. Now, in the subsequent investigation, the police focused almost immediately on Om Shinrikyo. In fact, they began raids within about 48 hours of the subway attacks. Those raids were really the beginning of a, of a physical investigation that would be observed for more than a year. And in fact, you can make the case that since the trials of some of the cult members are still underway at this time, and new revelations are coming forward, that the investigation still continues today. In the course of their raids, in the course of their investigations, law enforcement officials found precursors for the manufacture of nerve agents. They found some rather disconcerting biological organisms, processing equipment for chemical and biological materials. They also found conventional weapons. They found about 2,000 AK-47s. They found about a million rounds of ammunition. And they found an automated assembly line for the manufacture of more assault rifles in one of the cult buildings. Now, this was the scene at a place called Kamakuishiki, which is at the foot of Mount Fuji. It's the site of one of the major cult complexes. This was a raid on the second day after the subway attack. You'll note a couple of things. Uh, first of all, these are police personnel. They are wearing, however, military-issued chemical gear, the gear they received the previous week, the week before the subway attack. Now, in the course of their investigation into the, into the site, they brought with them the full range of equipment you would expect. They brought chemical detection equipment. They had uh, emergency medical supplies with them. They brought canaries in cages into some of the buildings at some of the cult facilities as an early warning system. Now, if all that failed, of course, you also had reporters who didn't have protective chemical gear, uh, and they're standing off to the left there. So they really had redundancy built into their detection system. The raids continued for an extended period of time, but so did the violence. There were at least five subsequent attacks on stations, train stations, and subway stations in Japan following the Tokyo subway attack. Now, two of these were copycat attacks. They involved essentially tear gas agents or something, something, some chlorinated chemical compound of that kind. But in at least three instances, devices designed to release cyanide gas were placed in Tokyo subway stations. And these have very clearly been linked to Om Shinrikyo. The media play, and it says O.J. Simpson there, maybe I should say Monica Lewinsky-style media play, just to update my slides. But the fact is that this story did dominate virtually all the media outlets in Japan. And in fact, it was one of the leading news stories around the world, as you may recall, for about 30 days, or roughly right up until the day that the federal building in Oklahoma City blew up. Continuing fear, let's put that in perspective as well. It has now been three years, more than three years, since the Tokyo subway attack. To say that people in the streets of Tokyo walk around afraid of packages on subways or they are afraid to get in the subway system, that's not accurate. That's not a true statement anymore. The Japanese people, just like the American people, like people everywhere, are very, very good at taking fears and if they de determine that at a certain point there's nothing they can do about those fears, putting them in a box, locking the box, and sliding it under their bed. And that's what's happened in Japan. However, at a certain level, you don't forget that. You remember where those fears are. They can come out again. For example, there have been a series of poisoning incidents in Japan over the last six months. A number of mass poisonings involving arsenic, involving cyanide, involving other chemical agents. And even though there's nothing to link those incidents to Om Shinrikyo or to any religious cult, the fears have come out again. People are once again asking, how could this happen in our society? How is this possible? Now, the Tokyo attack shook the world. It was a wake-up call to people everywhere. And it was a very effective wake-up call. But the thing is, it shouldn't have come as a surprise. There were a number of events that led up to that attack. I want to take a look at some of those. Now, the first of these took place in June of 94 in a city called Matsumoto. This was a legitimate release of sarin that killed seven people, hospitalized more than 200 others. 
it got very little media play around the world. Very little outside of Japan. It was a front page story there, but it got very little play elsewhere. A little over two weeks later, at a place called Kamakuishiki, and if you remember carefully, we've already mentioned them. <coughs> Mysterious fumes were released which sickened dozens of townspeople in a fairly rural area of Japan. Now, an investigation by the authorities, which would not be made public until January 1 of 95, would demonstrate that the ser a chemical sarin had been released in the environment. Then, on March 6th of 95, a commuter train from Yokohama is engulfed by toxic fumes. Again, about two dozen people are sickened, though none seriously, no one killed, but an event that, that seemed to be building to something. And then just five days before the subway attack, three briefcase devices were found in a Tokyo subway station, which may suggest something far, far more frightening even than the nerve agent attack itself. Let's explore each of these in a little more depth. The Matsumoto event in June of 94. Matsumoto is a very nice city of about 300,000 people, located about 200 miles north northwest of Tokyo. It is, among other things, the gateway to the Nagano region, the gateway to the Olympics area, the Japanese Alps. Light industry, agriculture, tourism. In fact, the city is dominated by a 350-year-old shogunate-era castle, surrounded by a moat, a lovely setting. Not the kind of place you would think of when you start thinking about super terrorism. On the evening of June 27th, a Monday evening, sarin gas was released into a residential neighborhood, a neighborhood that had absolutely no, no political, military, or other symbolic importance, nothing that would make it stand out, or at least it seemed, as a terrorist target. Now, it was a warm night. People had their windows open. It was a dry evening as opposed to being wet. It was actually an ideal evening for disseminating a nerve agent. Local authorities, and I mentioned before, the police in Japan are very decentralized. So the Nagano Prefecture police investigated this case. Now, Nagano police are far more comfortable with investigating uh, petty crimes or traffic violations than they are looking into acts of WMD terrorism. And so they were not really up to this challenge. It was further compounded when no one stepped forward to claim responsibility. This wasn't a case of, you know, pay me money or I'll do it again. This wasn't a case of this was a great blow for the such and such Liberation Army. This was, this was just a killer win that came in the night and killed seven people. 200 people hospitalized. Well, the authorities, the law enforcement community in Nagano, chose to focus their investigation on a local businessman. In fact, the first person to call in a 911 call that night, a guy by the name of Kono. Now, they focused on him for some reasons that seemed to them to make very good sense. I mean, well, you know, if you're familiar with the concept of profiling, this guy certainly seemed to stand out. I mean, here was a guy, a Japanese businessman, who had changed jobs several times in his career. He lived in a big old house that he had inherited from his mother, and he didn't take very good care of it. He collected Volkswagen Beetles. And sealing, sealing his fate was the fact that when the authorities went into his gardening shed, they found gardening chemicals. So right there, you put all those things together, and this guy, this guy was clearly public enemy number one. They let this guy twist in the wind for about three months. Now, never mind. As I said before, he was the first one to call in a 911 call. What happened was he heard his dog, one of his dogs barking a little bit after dinner time. It was about 9 o'clock or so. He was watching TV. Here's his dog barking. He says, excuse me, wife. Goes outside, sees one of his dogs dead, the other one foaming at the mouth. Very concerned. He goes back in. Now he finds his wife prostrate on the floor. She is, she is overcome by the chemical herself. He's very concerned. He dials 911, even as he himself is overcome with the chemical. He goes into the hospital, stays in the hospital for about three weeks, loses 40 pounds in the process. His wife is left in a permanent vegetative state. His oldest daughter is also affected by the chemicals. You know, obviously, this guy was, was, was a clear target. Now, unfortunately, what the police failed to note, and what we would ultimately learn in the course of the investigations and the confessions that followed,
was that this had been an attack targeted against the lives of three judges. Three judges who happened to live in that neighborhood and who were about to hand down a judgment in a land dispute involving an obscure religious organization known as Om Shinrikyo. The cult involved in this land dispute had determined they could not afford to lose the case. And so the leader of the cult took aside one of his members, his chief scientist, a man by the name of Hideo Murai, and he told Murai, take a team, go to Matsumoto, and kill these judges, because we cannot have this judgment. We can't afford it. And since you're going anyway, why don't you take that new weapon that you've been working on, and let's give it a field test. And so it was that five members of Om Shinrikyo drove from the cult's headquarters to Matsumoto in this truck. Well, a truck not completely dissimilar from this one. The plan was very straightforward. They were going to park in front of the courthouse in broad daylight. They were going to release sarin into a chamber, which would heat it up, raise it to its aerosol point, and release it as a cloud. A silent, invisible, odorless, tasteless cloud of pure death. That was the plan. It was to be done in broad daylight in downtown Matsumoto. Great plan. However, and it's very important to keep in mind that whenever you start talking about Om Shinrikyo, there's almost always a however involved. Sometimes it's funny, sometimes it's ludicrous, sometimes it's a little macabre. In this case, the team waited and waited and waited. You see, Hideo Mirai overslept. And so the team was late getting on the road. By the time they got to Matsumoto, it was after 5 o'clock, the courthouse was closed. Now let me, let me share this with you, and this, this may, I doubt this will be a revelation. When you're talking about murderous, death-dealing Buddhist cults, as a rule, you don't want to go back to the leader of the cult and tell him that, oops, we overslept and therefore we didn't carry out the mission. Sorry. So what they had to do was they had to confront either going back and telling the boss that, oh, well, we messed up, or they had to improvise. And so what they did was they improvised, and they improvised rather effectively. What they did was they found that the three judges were living in a dormitory in this one neighborhood. They were all staying in the same dormitory. They pulled into a gravel parking lot adjacent to the area, turned on the chemical generator, and it released a cloud of sarin into this area. Now, the three buildings formed something of a courtyard. The dormitory was about, was about three stories tall. These townhouses here were about three stories tall. This apartment building was about five or six stories tall. So it created, essentially, a courtyard. And just like leaves in a little breeze in a courtyard get swept up, so too did the sarin. Even though it's heavier than air, five or six times heavier than air, the currents lifted it up, raised it up into windows up on the fifth, sixth floor of some of those buildings. And thus it was that you had a number of people, including the judges, overcome by the chemical. Now it's interesting to note the judges weren't killed, but to my knowledge, no ruling has ever been handed down in that land dispute either. The team got back on the road, drove back to headquarters, mission accomplished. Now, a little over two weeks later, at a place called Kamakuishiki, at the foot of Mount Fuji, lovely rural community, small farms, dairy farms, some golf courses, small town, beautiful setting. However, it is marred by a number of large factories and dormitories, or at least it was, a number of large factories and dormitories, very ugly assemblies of, of buildings and, and various litter which constitute the headquarters in Japan of Om Shinrikyo. As mentioned before, about two dozen townspeople reported having difficulties that required first aid. Some of them reported, reported difficulty breathing. Some of them had difficulty seeing. Their eyes seemed to be sort of, sort of tunnel visioning on them. Um, others, others just had, had a general sense of unease. At the same time that these reports were coming in, however, other townspeople drove by one of the cult buildings and subsequently reported to authorities seeing several, possibly even dozens, of cult members lying outside the building on the road, obviously, obviously ill. Some of them were clearly sick, spasming, having difficulty breathing, coughing, others lying very, very still. 
This information was made available to the authorities in July of 1994. We jump ahead to March 15, 1995. In what may or may not have been an experiment, three briefcases were found by police at Kasuma Gaseki Station. They were found underneath an escalator ramp at the station. And the reason they were, it was brought to the attention of the authorities is someone, someone went to the station manager and said, one of these is giving off a little vapor of some kind. You know, I, can, I can see that. Bomb squad came in, removed the packages, and, found, and took them apart and found that each contained identical components. Cylinders containing some, quote, unidentified, unquote, material. Hooked up to a vaporizer, an ultrasonic vaporizer. In turn, an electric fan and vent system, all of it powered by a camcorder battery. In the subsequent investigations, in the subsequent interrogations, it was learned that this had been planned as a release of botulin toxin in the Tokyo subway system. Now, it was also subsequently learned in the course of interrogations, and, and the police believe this to be true, that the cult member responsible for filling those cylinders with botulin toxin got cold feet at the last minute and opted instead of the bot tox slurry, opted to fill them instead with just water. So no toxin may have been released at that point. Nonetheless, the technology and the will and the intent was clearly there as well, just five days before the Tokyo subway attack. Now, I went to Japan in March of 95, excuse me, in Ju excuse me, in December of 94, specifically to look into the Matsumoto event. And I must say that when I went over there initially, um, I went over knowing absolutely nothing about the Matsumoto. In fact, I was approached by a Japanese television network who was looking for, apparently looking for a gaijin expert that they could invite in who would presumably not be as polite as the Japanese experts were being. And so I went over and I was very rude for a couple of weeks. But in the course of that time, I learned a number of things. And I concluded, based on what I saw, I visited Matsumoto, I talked to the victims, I talked to Kono, I, ta I, I explored a number, of, a number of different avenues, that clearly someone had a chemical weapon, someone had demonstrated a willingness to make and use sarin. And I said as much in a report that I published both in Japan and here in the United States, um, as well as, as, as in an interview on Japanese television, I said, look, it's clear someone has this. I think they're probably going to use it again. They've shown a willingness to use it in populated centers. So then the, the reporter, like a good reporter would, turned to me and said, well, okay, uh, Mr. Olson, where would be a likely target? What kind of target would be a logical use for this, for this chemical weapon? And I thought about it for a second, and actually it came fairly straight, straight to me. First of all, if you have a weapon of mass destruction, you don't want to use it against isolated populations. You want a lot of victims. I mean, what other point in having WMD unless your intent is to kill a lot of people? Next, if you're going to use a chemical weapon, you want to use a, do it in a confined space. Confined space maximizes your dosage, and dose is, after all, what really kills you. Also, if you're going to use a chemical weapon, controlled environment is critical. You don't want the wind to blow it away. You don't want rain to come in and wash it down. Uh, too hot, too cold, all these things work against you. And finally, if you're a serious terrorist, if you really want to make a message, have some resonance. You want to go after a target that has symbolic value. Well, I'd been in Tokyo now. I'd been in Japan for about two weeks. I'd been getting around the city. And it seemed very clear to me that the answer was, was in front of everybody's face. Perfect target for a terrorist in Japan with a chemical weapon is the Tokyo subway at rush hour. Now, this was December of 94. Um, as you can expect, come March of 95, my phone was ringing off the hook for a while. That was my 15 minutes of fame. Let's talk about the cult itself for a little bit. Om Shinrikyo, which is Japanese for Supreme Truth Sect. In terms, of, uh, in terms of, of, of talking about this group, it's important to note that this was not your, you know, a small band that lived in somebody's mother's basement. This was a full-blown multinational enterprise, literally with tentacles around the world, doing things in a very big way, probably an estimated value. You know, they estimated their value probably a little high, but it was still somewhere between probably $500 million and $1.5 billion in terms of cash and assets at their disposal. Theology, it was drawn from a variety of sources. I mean, it was, if you want to call it a theology, 
it was essentially more of a marketing campaign than a theology. But they talked about uh, about gods and goddesses from the Hindu pantheon, goddess, uh, god goddesses such as uh, Shiva the destroyer. Uh, Buddhism, certainly they presented themselves as a Buddhist sect. Asahara, the cult leader, got tremendous mileage from the fact that he had once made a trip to Tibet, or excuse me, to India, and had met the Dalai Lama. Now it appears that he forced his way virtually into that audience, but nonetheless he used that as, as a token of his credibility. They even talked about, uh, well they started out as a yoga school, and they continued to teach yoga, even to this day. And there were also elements of Christianity in their preachings. Uh, Asahara, the cult's leader, spoke uh, frequently in his preachings about the coming Armageddon, which in Japanese turns out to be pronounced Armageddon. Uh, from their purposes, it was the coming Third World War, a nuclear, biological, and chemical conflict which would depopulate Japan except for the true believers of Om Shinrikyo, who would emerge to restore the country. Cult was, as we're probably all well aware, very successful at recruiting well-educated members, scientists, engineers, um, college degreed individuals. Now, it's important to note, however, by and large, they recruited these people either from the ranks of college students themselves or people who were just starting out in their professional careers. People, if you will, at the bottom of the corporate or organizational pyramids. And as a consequence, in many cases, they were recruiting people who were a little bit immature in their thinking, a little bit, a little bit more open to the, to the suggestions of Om Shinrikyo's leadership. In terms of their numbers, worldwide, some estimates go as high as 60,000, some as low as 20. The truth is probably in the middle as it usually is, let's say 30 to 40,000 worldwide. They claimed as many as 30,000 adherents in the Soviet Union, former Soviet Union, alone. Now keep in mind, however, that the actual number of full-blown, I am a monk in the church, I am giving all of my worldly possessions to you, O leader of the group, that number is much smaller. Perhaps, uh, perhaps smaller than 10% of their total number. But we're still talking about 3,000, 4,000 dedicated to the point of being fanatical followers. Operations, as you can see in this, in this map, scattered around the world. In Japan, not only did they have their spiritual headquarters, they also had a number of business enterprises. For example, they ran a chain of noodle shops in Tokyo and other Japanese cities which were not only money-making enterprises, but also recruiting centers. They manufactured computers from components that they imported from Taiwan. It might be said that, by the way, that these computers, which they sold in, a, in stores of their own in downtown Tokyo, were actually, actually very well regarded by the consumer public. They were pretty high-powered. They came with a lot of software. Well, okay, the software was all stolen, but the thing is, they were passing those savings on to the consumer. And that was very, very popular in Japan, not a country where bargains are very easily found. Uh, they had a tea plantation in Sri Lanka. In fact, appar apparently they still have a tea plantation in Sri Lanka. Why they had a tea plantation in Sri Lanka, nobody's precisely clear. Uh, as you can see, there are a number of diamonds in, in Russia, in the former Soviet Union. The cult invested very early, very early in Russia. In fact, they invested while it was still the Soviet Union. They invested probably in the neighborhood of about $12 million buying influence, buying access in Moscow. And they happened to hit it right at the right time because they found a Moscow that was wide open to being bought. In fact, at one point, the cult was in business with a man by the name of Oleg Lobov. The cult and Mr. Lobov had established an organization known as the, as the Moscow Japan University. And it was located in some rather nice office space across the street from the Bolshoi Ballet. And Mr. Lobov doesn't appear to have done much except collected money for having established this, this facility, provided offices and facilities to the cult, uh, and which is okay because Lobov had a day job. Lobov was also chairman of the Russian National Security Council for President Boris Yeltsin at the time. The cult had offices in Bonn as well as in New York from the, from the mid-80s onward. And you can, a couple of diamonds in particular that are of interest. Uh, in Western Australia, the cult purchased a sheep station, a ranch in Western Australia, about 200 miles outside of Perth. It was about 200,000 acres. And they purchased this in, uh, in uh, 1993. Initially, they purchased it because it had uranium ore deposits. And in fact, they requested 
an export license for uranium ore from Australia to Japan. Now, this was denied even though the cult had already begun excavation of uranium ore for shipment. However, they had other purposes for that, for that ranch as well. In 1994, fall of 94, the cult sold the station to an Australian family. After the Tokyo subway attacks, after the media began focusing on the possibility that Om Shinrikyo was responsible, and in fact, once it became certain, that Australian family became a little bit anxious. They knew who they'd purchased it from, you see. So they called in the Australian authorities, and the military and the, and the police came, and took a look around the, around the ranch. And what they found was a little bit unsettling. They found the area where the uranium ore had been being mined. They found drums with ore ready for shipment. They found two outbuildings, which had been clearly used as laboratories at one time. In fact, some of the apparatus was still in those buildings. And they found an area in which the soil was clearly, had clearly been fairly recently disturbed. So they dug it up, and they found about two dozen sheep carcasses. Did some testing. Found that the sheep had all been killed with the nerve agent sarin. At some point in 1993 or early 94, Om Shinrikyo had staked the sheep out at various distances from a release point, and then using sarin, which they either smuggled in from Japan or manufactured in Australia, they used that chemical weapons agent to kill the sheep. It was their first testing of their new weapon. One last diamond. You see one in Central Africa. In 1993, Shoko Asahara, the leader of the cult, and about two dozen nurses and doctors who were members of the sect, went on a medical mission of mercy to Central Africa to treat victims of a, of a serious disease outbreak in, uh, in the former Zaire, now Congo. Uh, at least that was the cover story. In fact, they went to Zaire specifically to learn as much as they could about, and ideally, to bring back samples of the Ebola virus. In early 1994, on Russian radio, a cult member was quoted as saying that Ebola might make a very good biological weapon under certain circumstances. Now this, and do not try to look at the, uh, the words that you see on that screen. Uh, they are completely, completely impossible to read. But this diagram is, is a representation of the way the cult organized itself, or reorganized itself, right after the Matsumoto attack. Essentially, they took an organization which had been centered around just a very small group of cells and transformed it into a mock government, essentially a shadow government, mirroring elements of the Japanese government itself. There's a Ministry of Defense. There's a Ministry of Justice. There's a Russian ministry to take care of their operations in that country. They had a marketing division and an intelligence ministry. They even had a post office. That was headed by Asahara's wife. Cult's leadership, uh, some interesting individuals in this respect as well. In this picture, you see two of them. Uh, the gentleman in the, in the green robe to the left. It was the cult's chief scientist head of their science and technology ministry, Hideo Murai. You may remember he was the man who overslept on his way to Matsumoto. Now, Hideo Murai, and I had the opportunity to meet him and talk with him extensively on, on one occasion, was by training a nuclear physicist. He was in charge of their weapons of mass destruction program. And as evidenced by the attack in Matsumoto, he was a stone cold killer. Hideo Murai was recruited to Om Shinrikyo, at least in part, when he was offered more research money and better research facilities than he enjoyed in his private sector job. Interestingly enough, about a week after I met him, he was assassinated as he walked out of a cult office building in Tokyo. He was assassinated by the Japanese mafia, the Yakuza. Uh, he was assassinated by a, a, a Japanese of Korean descent who walked up to him, this was on live television, walked up to him as he walked out of the building and proceeded to stab him to death. Now apparently the reason that uh, the Yakuza was, was determined that he should die is because, not because they were, they were appalled by what the cult had done or anything of that nature, no. They were upset because he was appearing on television and appeared to be talking a little bit too much. They were concerned that sooner or later he was going to start talking about the fact that 
Om Shinrikyo was in business with the Yakuza. See, Om Shinrikyo used some of its laboratories, sheltered because of freedom of religion protections in the Constitution from, from searches by the authorities, to manufacture drugs like LSD, amphetamines, ecstasy, which were then sold by the Japanese mafia on the street. Now, it had, by the way, the drugs had a very bad reputation on the street. They were, they were considered garbage by the drug aficionados in, the, in, the, in Tokyo. Nonetheless, they were there and they were being sold. Apparently, the, the Yakuza decided they needed to quiet Mirai because he was talking too much. Now, the gentleman next to him, the other gentleman in the, in the green robe, is, a, is another guy who, is, who has a little bit different story. Um, this guy was in charge at one point of their Russian operations. He subsequently came back and following the attack on the subway, and at that point the disappearance of the cult's leader from, uh, from public view, he proceeded to serve as the cult's leading spokesman. Now he was on TV so much, and he was in the media so much, and he was a good enough looking young enough guy that he became something of a teen heartthrob in Japan. There were uh, a number of teen magazines that had his picture on the cover and then said, Joyu-san, be my boyfriend. Mr. Joyu was a former engineer with the Japanese space program who left and joined the cult because it offered more opportunity. He is also suspected, by the way, of having been the, if there was a deep throat in this whole story, possibly the police's leading informant. It's worth noting that after, the, that after the arrests began and after the trials began, his trial was completed very quickly. He got essentially a slap on the wrist. In fact, he's slated to come out of jail within the next six months. And he's been allowed to maintain, maintain contact with the residual Om Shinrikyo organization. Now, how do you do this? See, in Japan, when you go to jail, you're really not allowed visitors except family. Well, Joyu didn't have any family. So what to do? How to, main, how to, how to get contact with the outside world? He hit on a pretty good idea. He was allowed to adopt his 35-year-old assistant as his son. And that man has been scurrying back and forth between Joyu in jail and the Om Shinrikyo for about the last year or two. And again, Joyu is slated to come out within the next six months and in all likelihood is going to vie for, for leadership of the residual elements of the cult. The real, the real seminal figure in this story is Shoko Asahara, also his original name, Chizuo Matsumoto. 43-year-old venerated master, yogi, holy pope of Om Shinrikyo. Uh, for all I know, leader of the pack may be one of his titles as well. By all accounts, he's extremely charismatic. He was a very talented yoga instructor back in the days when the cult was known as the Temple of the Mountain Wizards, a name they got away from for obvious marketing reasons. Um, partially blind. In fact, he went to a school for the blind as a, as a young man, as a boy, uh, though exactly how limited his vision is is, un is unclear. We do know that he could see well enough when he was in school to sort of, sort of dominate his, his fellow students. We also have reports of him kicking his chauffeur out of the front seat of his Rolls Royce and roaring around downtown Tokyo with himself at the wheel. Um, so, you know, you know allow, it may be a miracle, maybe something else entirely. Politically ambitious, he actually ran for election to the Japanese parliament in 1990 along with about, uh, about 20 of his followers, um, and, and financially ambitious as well. It's interesting to note that in that election in 1990, he and his followers ran a campaign which was, which was ludicrous. I mean, Japanese campaigns tend to be very loud, they tend to be very, very noisy, they don't, uh, well, frequently they tend to make American election campaigns look like very lofty enterprises indeed, so that should give you an idea. Um, his campaign was ludicrous by Japanese standards. Essentially, it consisted primarily of cult members running around wearing paper mache elephant masks on their heads, sh uh, basically chanting, Osho, Osho, so whatever that's worth. Um, he was soundly defeated, as were all of his followers. Uh, this appears to have come as a major shock to him. He genuinely thought that he was going to win. And there are a number of Japanese analysts that suggest that that defeat in 1990 persuaded him that it would be impossible for him to achieve power through legitimate means. And in fact, they suggest that you can pretty much date his interest in weapons of mass destruction from that electoral defeat.
In his preachings, he talks of himself as being, among other things, the first enlightened one since the Buddha, and also the reincarnation of Jesus Christ. And while it is true that his father was a carpenter, that is about as far as I want to go with that, uh, with that parallel. He also is very much millennialist in his preachings. Again, we go back to the notion of Armageddon, the coming Third World War, the war that will, that will wipe everyone out of Japan except for the cult's true believers who will come from their, from their hiding places and reestablish Japan to its, to its rightful place. This is, by the way, a theme which is repeated over and over again in Japanese history and Japanese literature, uh, usually the part of a doomed hero who tries to restore Japan to greatness. There's also no question, based on the, on the testimony and the trials, based on the, the documents, based on the eyewitness reports, that Asahara was very much a hands-on manager of day-to-day -day operations within this group. It wasn't a case of being a figurehead. It wasn't a case of being a remote, remote character up on top of a mountain somewhere. This man appears to have been in the job of reaching out and saying, OK, you will do this. You will work there. You will get me that. Uh, in fact, I'm sure that there's probably, there's probably an opportunity for writing an, an MBA thesis on cult management in, a, in modern Japan in here somewhere, but I don't think I'm going to go there. Um, a very interesting man, uh, a man who was able to take an organization from nothing, from being a small walk-up yoga academy in 1983, and by 1990 have turned it into a multi-million dollar enterprise. Asahara had a dream. He dreamed of assuming power in Japan. He believed that the cult, his cult, Om Shinrikyo, represented a, a state, an independent nation within Japan. He believed that to realize his ambitions, he needed a military capability that was not only loyal to him, but capable of going toe-to-toe going -to -toe with the police or with the defense forces in Japan. Now, to do that, though, he knew he was outgunned. He knew he was outmanned. Therefore, it wasn't a real stretch for him to conclude that the logical path was to pursue weapons of mass destruction, weapons that would enable him to trump the existing forces in Japan. Because the bottom line for Shoko Asahara, ni Chizuo Matsumoto, was always power. It's power first, power last. Which brings us around to the reasons for the March 20th attack. I said before that the primary target for the attack was to kill as many police as possible. In fact, to kill them on their way to work. In fact, this attack was, about, was essentially a preemptive strike, an attempt to deter the police. See, we already mentioned before that the police had undergone training the week of March 13th in chemical protective gear and how to operate in a chemical environment. The reason for that was that after months of investigation and months of very painstaking work, the police in Japan had finally decided that they were going to begin initiating raids against cult facilities. Those raids were to begin on March 20th, 1995. And they were to be simultaneous raids. They were getting protective chemical gear because they believed in their hearts and in their minds that the cult had a chemical weapons capability. What they apparently did not believe was that Om Shinrikyo could possibly have known they were coming. What they could not possibly have been expected to understand was that Om Shinrikyo had penetrated both the police and the military months and even years before the subway attack. There were about a dozen members of the self-defense forces who were card-carrying 10%, I give my heart and soul to Om Shinrikyo members. There were about a half dozen members of the Tokyo police, the completely incorruptible Tokyo police, who also fit that category. In fact, these men, and men had been involved in staging, for example, clandestine raids, break-ins into industrial research facilities, stealing software, stealing hardware for use by Om Shinrikyo. Mitsubishi Heavy Industries, for one, was the site of a break-in by, by, these, by these men operating on cult leadership orders. So it was that late that week before the subway attack, possibly as late as Friday, March 17th, members of the cult who were in the police and military came to Asahara. 
came to Asahara at Kamakushiki and advised him that the police were planning to stage raids the following week, that they were going to start raiding on Monday, three days from that time. Asahara acted very quickly. He reached out to his followers and he said, okay, this is what we're going to do. We are going to attack the police. We are going to kill policemen on Monday morning. We're going to kill them on their way to work. We're going to use our chemical weapon sarin, and we're going to attack them in the subway. All that was great. Well, okay, there were three little problems there. First of all, at that point in time, they didn't have any sort of plan whatsoever for attacking the police on their way to work in the subway in Tokyo. They didn't have a, a nice contingency plan sitting in a file case somewhere. They didn't have a plan. Secondly, they didn't have a weapon. Remember that truck that was used at Kamakushiki, or used at Matsumoto, rather? That truck had been disassembled months before because the, the cult had been so sure after events took place at Kamakushiki, they were convinced the authorities were going to raid their facilities then. They didn't want the truck around, so they tore it to pieces and they scattered the pieces all over Japan. They didn't have a delivery system on Friday, March 17th. And about the sarin, they didn't have any sarin. They'd had some, but it had gone bad, and so they'd actually disposed of it weeks before. So here we have, okay, the orders are attack the police in the subways in Tokyo and use sarin, use the nerve gas. Well, okay, strike three. Right after the Tokyo subway attack, a number of analysts, chemical defense specialists, took a look at what had happened in Tokyo, and they said, okay, well, you know, the first call was, this couldn't possibly be nerve gas. There aren't enough dead people. If you'd really use nerve agent, you'd have a lot more dead people on the ground. Subsequent events proved that, in fact, it was sarin. So then the experts took a different tack. They said, okay, well, maybe it's sarin, but obviously these guys didn't have clue one what they were doing. I mean, obviously they were inept, they bungled. I mean, this was a very poorly planned and executed attack. Well, let's keep this in mind as we move forward through the rest of the presentation. The Tokyo subway attack was not a well-planned, well-executed, carefully orchestrated terrorist assault. It was a weekend project for this group. On Friday morning, they didn't have a plan, they didn't have a weapon. Come Monday morning, the results were rather different for 3,800 men and women in the Tokyo subway system. Why deter the, the police beyond the obvious? The police were going to start raids. Why did they have to stop them? See, the cult had, did have a plan. Their plan was to stage a coup to overthrow the Japanese government. The so-called November coup, which was set for November of 96, was to be a combined chemical and biological and conventional attack against the Japanese government. They were going to overthrow the government. But in March of 95, they weren't ready. If the police attack us now, so went Asahara's thinking, you know, they're going to preempt us. We can't, we can't strike. We've got to stop them. And so they fired that shot across the bow in order to try and keep their hopes of the November coup alive. Now, it doesn't matter whether or not they could credibly have overthrown the Japanese government. That's really not important when you start talking about groups like these. Fact is, they, and particularly their leadership, believed that they could do it, which meant that they were going to try. Fulfillment of prophecy, I throw this in simply because the cult frequently talked about weapons of mass destruction. They talked about the coming Armageddon. They talked about, well, there were cult members in downtown Tokyo the day before the subway attack, handing out leaflets, on one side of which was an advertisement for Asahara's new book, which talked about coming disasters far worse than the Kobe earthquake and the coming use of weapons of mass destruction, the coming Armageddon. And then on the other side, and this is just a good marketing strategy, on the other side, just so you don't automatically throw it away, they had a nice map of the Tokyo subway system. So whether that's foreshadowing uh, or not, it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a great, uh, great little warning. Now this is important, I think. We talked before about the fact that the cult recruited well-educated young people, people that were still in college or people that were just beginning their professional lives. The Japanese educational system tends to produce 
fairly immature adults in terms of the, in terms of their development as individuals. The Japanese system is geared more towards producing well-educated, well-educated to, uh, pieces to go into the corporate enterprises. It is expected in Japanese society that you use your period of your in, in life during your 20s to answer a lot of the spiritual questions or, or religious questions that you don't really have time for while you're studying for exam hell to get sure, make sure you get into the right universities. And so, for example, it's not uncommon in Japan for, for young women raised as Buddhists to convert to Christianity just before they get married. Reason being, the trappings of a Christian wedding, the white dress, the tuxedos, all the flowers, they're very popular among Japanese women. And so you convert to Christianity for a while, you have the wedding, you also have a Buddhist wedding just to be sure that you cover that base. And then later on in life you may explore other things. You may try, you may explore yoga as a way of reaching enlightenment. You may pursue um, some of the other Taoism, whatever. Ultimately most Japanese end up going back to Buddhism towards the end of their lives. At least in part I think because Buddhism does have that lovely component called reincarnation built into the process. Very comforting as you enter, enter your declining years. But what was happening here was that Om Shinrikyo was marketing itself very, very effectively to a population that was looking for answers. They presented this, this hodgepodge of theologies that seemed to have an answer for everything. They had an organization which was everywhere. Om Shinrikyo was not invisible in Japan. In fact, Asahara frequently popped up on television as a, spokes, as a, as a commentator on contemporary events. They were very, very visible and they were very aggressive in their marketing. Young cult members, young female cult members would go out and attract and recruit young, young men. Young men would go out and attract young females, bring them back into the cult, get them to watch a video, get them to do this, join the social clubs, do this or that. Pretty soon they found themselves belonging. But the group think went beyond just the young members. In a press conference that was held just a couple of weeks after the Tokyo subway attack, and by this time, Om Shinrikyo had pretty well been fingered. Joyu, the young teen heartthrob, was trying to explain what the cult was all about. And he was getting frustrated. Finally, he said, look, there's a book. If you read this book, you will understand what Om Shinrikyo is all about, what we are trying to do. And he held that book up. Now, he didn't hold up a book by Asahara that laid out a philosophy. He didn't hold up a political treatise of any kind or any sort of any sort of, of economic text. He held up a novel, actually a science fiction novel, actually a trilogy of novels by an American author, a science fiction classic known as the Foundation Trilogy. Now for those of you that have read it, you understand what I'm saying here. For those of you that haven't, let me summarize it very, very quickly. In the Foundation Trilogy, the author, Isaac Asimov, an American, sets in this far distant science fiction future a galactic empire. Now the galactic empire is in decline, but only one man seems to know it. He's developed a means of using mathematics and, and modeling to project the future trends. And he can see that the empire is going to collapse and there's going to be a hundred thousand years of barbarism and darkness. And so he says, okay, I've got a plan. And he establishes a, what he calls his foundation, a group of scientists, engineers, and scholars sets them up in a little remote corner of the galaxy, sets up their, little, their little, own little version of, of a government, of a society. Then when the empire collapses, they step forward and assert themselves and reestablish society in about a tenth of the time. Om Shinrikyo, even up to the ranks of some of its senior followers, appear to have been caught up in living a science fiction fantasy as their basic, the basic underpinning of what they were doing. Why don't we take a break? We're going to go into technologies and agents that were used by the cult and also some wrap-up observations. Why don't we take five or ten minutes and we'll reconvene. Thank you. <laughs>
Let's take a look at the technologies and the chemical agents. Well, actually, just let's just use the word agents that were employed by Om Shinrikyo. First of all, let's explore production method, and specifically, let's talk about the sarin that was used in the Tokyo subway attacks. I mentioned before, they didn't have any sarin on March 17th, and they needed it, they needed it in a hurry. Well, the thing was, they didn't have access to their facilities back in Kamakuishiki. They didn't have large-scale facilities available. What they ended up doing was they used essentially a piece of equipment that would fit on a table not much larger than this podium. A piece of equipment they bought in downtown Tokyo over the counter for about $300,000. A piece of equipment that is used commercially, it's used in, in universities, literally around the world, for the purposes of producing small quantities, small batches for research purposes. Now, obviously, a small piece of equipment like that could not produce a lot of sarin, couldn't produce it really rapidly. They worked that piece of apparatus basically nonstop for virtually the entire weekend, producing nerve agent for the attack. The sarin was probably, probably manufactured according to the German salt process. This was essentially the process developed, the recipe developed by German scientists in the late 1930s. Now, this was back when the Nazi war machine was looking for a new wonder weapon, and nerve agent was it. Now, at the time that this report, that, that this, uh, this revelation, if you will, came out, there was a great, deal of, a great deal of excitement in Japan because everybody said, oh, okay, this clearly proves that the Russians helped the Ohm Shinrikyo learn how to make sarin because the Russians used the German salt process to make sarin. And that was good for, uh, for about a day or two until it was pointed out that the United States used the German salt process to make sarin, too. Reason being, both Russia and the United States captured German chemical weapons scientists at the end of the Second World War. We were all building off of their techniques, all of their technologies. So bottom line was, the German salt process is well documented in dozens of books around the world. The sarin used in the Tokyo subway attack was not distilled. Now this is important. The material that comes out of the recipe for the German salt process produces chemical that's only about 25 to 30 percent pure. The benchtop apparatus that the cult was using, that, that synthesizer, did not have the capability built in to do distillation. That would have required a different step. It would have required more time. They didn't have that time. And so the agent that was used was essentially exactly what came out, 25 30% pure. Some samples taken by the, uh, by the self-defense forces ranged from about 15% pure as high as 40%, so still within that range. Cult also added a chemical, acetonitrile, a solvent which is very volatile. See, they understood very, very well that sarin, even at best, is only about as volatile as water. If you spill a puddle of water over here and a puddle of sarin over there, they're going to evaporate at about the same speed. They don't go up violently in a cloud. On the other hand, acetonitrile is very volatile. It goes, forms a cloud, evaporates very, very quickly. The hope the hope of Om Shinrikyo was that somehow that volatile solvent would carry some sarin into the air with it, accelerate the evaporative process. Now that happens to be really bad chemistry, and it's really bad physics. But what it does do is it presents a very confusing situation to responders when they come in trying to find out what's going on. Because, again, you can't smell sarin, but you can certainly smell a solvent like acetonitrile. And the initial responders Many initially thought that that was the kind of chemical they were dealing with, a solvent chemical, a chemical that they were familiar with. The delivery system in Tokyo, obviously very inefficient. I mean, essentially we were talking about two-ply plastic bags manufactured by the cult, filled with this chemical soup and then punctured with umbrella tips. As a result, the evaporation of the chemical was really the most active or most large-scale mode of dispersal, the one that would have endangered the largest number of people. But given that evaporation rate, the people in greatest danger were those who came into physical contact with the liquid instead. One of the trains that pulled into Kasumigaseki Station, pulled into the station, the, uh, the people got off the train, an assistant station manager went on the train trying to find out what the problem was. He saw a package on the floor of the train that was leaking this, this, this fluid onto the floor. He reached down, remember his uniform, his green coat, his little hat, and his white cotton gloves, his nice absorbent white cotton gloves? He reached down, picked up that package, 
took it off the train, and he made it about 100 paces before he collapsed and died on the station platform. Same station, same train, package is gone now. Maintenance worker comes onto the train, sees this puddle of liquid on the floor, smells solvent. Well, I better clean that up, he says. Doesn't have a mop handy, so he gets down on his hands and knees, starts using newspapers and rags to soak it up. And he died on the train. That was two of your 12 deaths that morning. Again, classic evidence coming into physical contact with the liquid was critical there. Now, this was what it was like. This is, this is a notional image of one of the subway cars. Again, the package was placed just next to the center door of the center car of the train. The package itself, and, and by the way, a very, very highly paid graphics artist did this work for me. Two-ply plastic bag containing the sarin soup wrapped in newspaper. Now, the newspaper had essentially three functions. First of all, and this is, a, this is an important point to keep in mind, Om Shinrikyo did not believe in suicide attacks. They never staged an attack that didn't have a back door for the attacking team. Unlike some other groups out there that, that we have to contend with in this world, there was always an element of safety built in, even if it was only marginal. In this case, they recognized that if you took a plastic bag full of a super toxic liquid and you placed it at your feet and you started puncturing it with an umbrella, there was a real good chance you were going to get some back splatter. So the newspaper served as a buffering agent. It served to, to make the chemical ooze out rather than splash out. Secondly, the newspaper was a very effective camouflage. If you go on, walk onto a, to a train carrying a water balloon, for all intents and purposes, you're going to be noticed. But in Japan, if you walk on with a package wrapped in newspaper, you're just one of 100,000 people walking into the subway system with a newspaper wrapped package. Very common to have everything from lunches to very nicely wrapped gifts wrapped in newspaper to protect the nice wrapping paper. So it was an effective camouflage. Third, if you're Om Shinrikyo, you say, ah, I'll use a newspaper published by a rival Buddhist group. And then when the police do their investigation, maybe they'll think that they might have had something to do with it. So this package gets punctured by the umbrella, and it oozes out onto the platform. And then you have the effects of the agent spreading out from the center car out to the two ends. There are reports of people riding the train, sitting at one far end of the car, riding for maybe three or four station stops in order to get to their stop before they got off. Because all the trouble was happening at the far end. It wasn't their concern. Also of interesting, an interesting note and a, an interesting uh, sidebar on Japanese psychology as opposed to perhaps American psychology. Every one of the subway trains in, in the Japanese system has a panic button, an emergency button that you can hit to get a hold of the driver and let him know that there's an emergency situation. There are, according to reports that I think are very credible, there was only one instance of anyone bothering to push that button and disturb the driver as he was going about his rounds. Now, that was the nerve agent that was used in Tokyo. The nerve agent used in Matsumoto, and an issue of some other concern uh, in other ways for us, is the facility known as Satyan 7. Satyan 7 was a dedicated nerve agent plant concealed behind a shrine to the goddess or god Shiva, Shiva the destroyer from the Hindu, Hindu religion. Now this plant was probably never successfully operated. In fact, it, you know, there's a lot of evidence that that event in July of 94 at Kamakuishiki, remember the two dozen people who reported injuries, people seeing victims lying outside the building on the ground. In all likelihood, they had a major accidental release at that plant. They were not apparently able to make the plant run safely. This is further, uh, further proven, I think, by the fact that in the fall of 94, cult members from Moscow went to the Russian city of Volgograd. This is the former Stalingrad. In an effort to recruit chemical engineers who had worked in the nerve gas facilities at the chemical, large chemical facility known as Kimpromverks. Now, for a variety of reasons, they were unsuccessful in recruiting anybody to come back to Japan with them to help them make their plant work. Now, this is, uh, again, a couple, of a couple of reasons for this. First of all, Volgograd, particularly in 1994, had a lot more in common with Brezhnev's Russia than Yeltsin's Russia. So the appearance of two or three Buddhist monks walking around, waving money, trying to recruit nerve gas scientists might have stood out a little bit to the security apparatchiks in Volgograd. Secondly, 
What they were being offered was a round-trip ticket to Japan and $1,000 in cash. And even in 1994, $1,000 just didn't go as far in, in New Russia as we might like to think. So for whatever reasons, the Russians chose not to take them up on their generous offer. All of which is really good news, because Satyan 7 was designed to produce chemical weapons agents on a near military level of significance. Thousands of kilos per year were within its design parameters. And you remember this picture. This was at Kamakuishki. This building is the site known as Satyan 7. Now, this is looking inside the plant from a window up, up on about a third floor level. This photograph was taken by an Italian journalist who snuck through police lines and snapped off some pictures and got them out. A couple of things to note. First of all, there are reactors, a lineup of three chemical reactors along the right side of the, of the picture. Uh, they're distinguished by the tanks, the, the pumps with the agitators above them. There's a distillation column. Yes, they did understand that you needed to distill the agent to make it work. And for a sense of scale, that's about 12 to 15 feet high. This was a fairly large scale enterprise. And if it does look a little bit Rube Goldberg-esque, uh, keep in mind again that what we had here was a facility that was essentially designed by chemical engineering students, not by seasoned chemical engineers. Now this photograph, just to the right of that initial photograph, and again you can see the reactors on the left, so we've just shifted our viewpoint to the right, is interesting for a couple of reasons. First of all, a number of cult buildings were seen with large, ornate pipe assemblies outside the buildings. These were part of an air cleaning system or an air filtration system, and you can see the interior part of that system right there. Now, furthermore, see that area in the circle? Let me zoom in on that a little bit. What you can see there is a flange connecting two pipes together. What you can also see, if you look carefully, is that underneath that flange is what appears to be an open barrel or a bucket. And in the original photograph, it's even more clear keep that in mind. Now this is looking up and behind the area we were looking at just before. See a chemical processing vessel here. You can see the, uh, the thermal wrapping around it. It means it, was, it was, there would heat that, that, uh, that vessel. There's a control room in the back. The entire plant was computer controlled, probably with the cult's own computers. That way they were able to save a little money there. Raw material tank and down below you can see pipes. If you look carefully you can see that those pipes are wrapped in plastic sheeting as if to try and try and prevent spillage or leaking. Now, I don't know if there are any chemical engineers in the class, but it seems to me that one of the things you don't want in a chemical plant, particularly a chemical plant with flanges and pipes, are leaking flanges and pipes. Just not a, not a good career move again. Now in the back here, and this is looking up and looking left, you can see a chemical filling station. This was designed to take toxic chemicals and place them into packages or containers of various kinds. And it also gives you a good sense of the scale inside that building. The cult dabbled in other agents. I said before Satyan 7 was a nerve agent plant. They dabbled in, for example, VX. We know they made VX. We know they used VX. But they didn't use VX the same way they used sarin. They used VX as a weapon of assassination. Use nerve agent to assassinate in the following manner. You fill a hypodermic syringe with VX. Make sure you've got your rubber glove on because you want to be protected. This is not a, not a suicide attack. You walk up behind your intended target. And ideally, you inject them, or if you can't inject them, you at least spray them on their bare skin of their neck with the VX. And I did this on at least four occasions. In two occasions, they killed their targets outright. In one occasion, their victim was in a coma for two weeks. In the fourth case, they missed. Still, all in all, not a bad batting average. And along with an incident in London about 10 or 15 years ago, and another example of using WMD as an anti-personnel weapon one-on-one. -on -one. We know they dabbled in, in and played with Taboon, which is another World War II vintage Nazi, Nazi invention, similar to sarin in terms of its lethality. We know they made mustard. We don't know how much mustard. We don't know what they did with the mustard. We don't know where it is. But we know that they played with mustard agent. And we also are aware of the fact that they dabbled in cyanide compounds. In fact, the cult members that were involved in the subway attack, when they, after the attack, after the raids began, they were directed to go, essentially go to the mattresses, hide out, find safe houses. Each of them was given between 5 and 10 pounds of, of sodium cyanide to take with them, just in case they might need it downstream. And in fact, we know of at least one team that decided that they could do something with their sodium cyanide. In May of 94, a little bit after the, so the subway attack, 
at Shinjuku Station, the busiest subway station in Tokyo. A cleaning woman went into a men's room, opened one of the stall doors, and found two bags, two plastic bags, one on top of the other. Without knowing what they were, she separated them, took them out, put them by the front door, and called maintenance to come take them away. Well, this is what they were. The one bag contained hydrochloric acid. Another bag contained sodium cyanide. In the acid bag was an igniter wrapped inside a condom. This is an old Japanese Red Army terrorist trick, by the way. The notion being that the condom would, would or the igniter would, would catch fire, it would melt the bags, mix the chemicals, and produce hydrogen cyanide gas. In two subsequent attacks, a two-pronged attack, one at Tokyo Station and one at Kasumagaseki Station again, a similar devices were used. And in this case, one of the two actually did go off. Twelve men were overcome, however, they were rescued, no, there were no fatalities. The chemical reaction was slower than the terrorists had expected it to be. But the potential was very profound. Estimates showed that there were about 10,000 man lethal doses of hydrogen cyanide potentially in these chemical mixtures. Now we talked a lot about chemical weapons, but one of the revelations that has come out in recent days has been the cult's interest in biological weapons. In fact, Shoko Asahara was first turned on to WMD by looking into biological weapons. He was looking into biological weapons because he was watching CNN coverage of preparations by the coalition for dealing with Saddam Hussein in the Gulf. He would sit and watch CNN and Japanese newscasts, and he would see the greatest military in the world by his lights shaking in their boots at the prospect of little tin pot dictators' biological weapons capability. He saw the preparations that the US was taking, that the coalition forces were taking, and it occurred to him that this might be a weapon worth having. And so he directed his researchers to pursue biological weapons, and as an afterthought, also to go after chemical weapons. In fact, they had a bio laboratory as early as 1990 for the express purpose of producing biological toxins. Subsequently, they tore that laboratory down, replaced it with two laboratories, one at Kamakushiki and another one in Tokyo itself. We know that the cult experimented with, produced botulin toxin, anthrax, cholera, Q fever. And we've talked before about that mission to Zaire looking for Ebola. We also know that between 1990 and 1994, they released biological weapons agents in Tokyo on at least four occasions. The first of these actually occurred in April of 1990 in Tokyo, while most of the cult members were out of Japan, actually, at a retreat near Okinawa. One team was left behind driving a car around that was designed to release botulin toxin. They drove it around Tokyo, primarily around the Japanese parliament buildings, the diet. There were no reports of any injuries from that release in 1990. We skip ahead a few years to June of 1993. Once again, the determination was made, let's release botulin toxin. Again, we will have a spray vehicle as our means of dispersal. This time, however, we've got a target. We're going to time the attack around the time of the royal wedding, the wedding of the crown prince. There'll be a lot of people in town, a lot of dignitaries. So what we're going to do is we're going to drive around the imperial palace grounds and release botulin toxin to the wind. Once again, there were no reports of any injuries associated with that attack. Frustrated, but not, not yet finished. Later that month, the cult decided to try a different angle. This time, from their laboratory in East Tokyo, they released anthrax spores into Tokyo itself. Now, at the time, there were reports of foul-smelling brown steam spotting on cars and sidewalks, people complaining about pets dying, uh, plants dying, a variety of problems. This appears to have been a deliberate effort to release anthrax in its wet spore form. But again, there are no reports of any injuries or any deaths associated with that release of anthrax. And then in March 1995, we already talked about the abortive attempt to release botulinum toxin in the Tokyo subway, which of course had no injuries or, or reported injuries. Now while we look at this picture, and this is a diagram 
given to me by a cult member who worked in this laboratory and described the process of harvesting the material from the fermenters, taking it around and, and drying it, freeze drying it, heat drying it, grinding it, and then spreading it, spraying it on guinea pigs. We have heard uh, frequently in recent days about the, the danger posed by biological weapons. Tremendous effort has gone into trying to ready ourselves to deal with this threat. Men and women in the military are being required to take anthrax inoculations, vaccinations. Uh, we are spending a lot of money on research and into defense, both domestically and, and internationally. But there, was, there were no reports of any deaths with these, these documented releases of super toxic materials. Botulin toxin, a thousand times more toxic than nerve agent. Anthrax, as we all know, the, uh, <laughs> the, the, the great threat of the moment. Well, let's, let's step back. There are several things to keep in mind when we look at Om Shinrikyo and its biological weapons program. First of all, we said before, the cult was very good at recruiting scientists and engineers. But by and large, these were physical scientists and physical engineers, electronic specialists, that sort of thing. The cult was not terribly successful at recruiting scientists in the biological fields, in the life sciences. So in many instances, they were, they were cobbling their expertise together. For example, the cult member who worked in this laboratory that I debriefed was an electrical engineer by training. He was selected to work in the lab because he had, quote, technical training, unquote. So a lack of expertise. Secondly, they appear to have made some tactical errors. For example, the release of botulin toxin or of any biological toxin in broad daylight without special preparation of that material is counterproductive. Ultraviolet light, bright sunlight tends to degrade and decay these materials very quickly. Another thing we, we know, we don't advertise, but we know is that the size of the particle is a critical consideration with biological weapons. Too small, you inhale it, you exhale it, it doesn't do any damage. Too large, it falls out of the sky like dirt, hits the ground and is destroyed that way. So maybe they didn't get the particles the right size. Wet release of anthrax spores, pretty inefficient way of doing it. They may not have had the right strain of anthrax, that's also a consideration, or they may have overcooked it, also a possibility. But let me leave this, this, this one last possibility. The revelations about the cult's biological weapons research occurred only in the months and years following their arrest on the chemical weapons charges associated with the subway attacks. These attacks, the, the attack in Tokyo, the attack in Matsumoto, it is impossible to overestimate the embarrassment that these events caused to official Japan, to the law enforcement community, to the government of those countries. The loss of face was profound. An anecdote on this point, in Australia, following the investigation of the, of the former sheep ranch, the site in Western Australia, Australian authorities invited Japanese officials to come down and they would share information. The Australians presented all their information to the, author to the Japanese police, to their investigators, laid it all out for them, sat back waiting for the, the, for the information to flow the other direction. The Japanese visitors said thank you very much. They got up, they caught the plane back to Tokyo without sharing any information. This was a matter of tremendous face. Now, if you put, your place, put yourself in the place of a Japanese official at this point in time, having made these discoveries about these biological incidents, and in the back of your mind having some nagging doubts, You've got all the cult members in jail now. You are trying them on clear-cut cases of murder associated with the chemicals. What is your real incentive at this point to go back and sift through health records looking for unexplained flu deaths from five or ten years ago? Chemical, biological, you've got to talk nukes. And in fact, remember that the leader of the cult, scientific organization was a nuclear physicist by training. Mirai had worked the Russian connection. In his notebooks were references to nuclear weapons that were available for perhaps three million dollars each. Now, many people have gone to Russia since the collapse of the Soviet Union with money in their pockets thinking that they could acquire nuclear weapons. Now, virtually all of them have come out of Russia without their money and without nuclear weapons. But the fact remains is that there was at least some serious dialogue underway on the part of the cult as they were pursuing this. But if they couldn't get it from the Russians, 
They weren't above trying to do it themselves. Remember the ranch in Australia. They initially purchased that because it had uranium ore deposits. They were also negotiating for land in Japan that had uranium ore deposits, which they hoped to exploit without having to get export permits. They already had obtained high energy lasers for the purposes of enrich enriching uranium. And they had done a great deal of research into the technology required. And now, observations, where I share my own half-baked theories and cockamamie ideas about what actually happened there, and invite you to share your own as well. First of all, the, the, the question that comes out, I talked before about the, uh, about the expressions of disbelief on the part of weapons experts over the, the lack of, de of deaths in the Tokyo subway attack. So the question remains, why were there only a dozen fatalities? First of all, it's important to keep in mind that there was a very small quantity of chemical used in the attack. The total quantity of chemical used in the subway attack, all the chemicals combined, was only about probably in the neighborhood of 24 liters. Now of that, about half of that or more was acetonitrile. And of the remaining amount, it was only about 25% sarin, because they didn't have time to distill it. In fact, the reason only five trains were attacked instead of six, as the original plan had spelled out, they didn't have enough time to make enough agent. They had to scale back their attack. So you had a small quantity of agent, a small quantity of chemical, low grade of agent, lousy dispersal method, at least in part because the cult members were not willing to risk their own lives. Frankly, if I were a terrorist who was prepared to give my life for the cause, and there are certainly those people out there, as we've seen all too, all too evidently laid out before our eyes in the last few months, I could, I could go on to a subway car at rush hour with a Super Soaker 2000 filled with this sarin mix, and I could kill hundreds of people right there. It's not a high technology solution by any means, but it's one which requires a little bit different degree of dedication to your cause. Another factor that's worth considering. Some of you have been in, have been in Japan. You've been in the subway system. You know that in the newer stations, like at Kasuma Gaseki, the ceilings are relatively low. They are very modern stations. And you have air vents about every three feet or so apart in the ceiling, air vents the size of, of typical uh, typical light fixtures, industrial light fixtures in this country. The air cleaning cycle, this, the, the air processing cycle, is very, very vigorous in the newer stations. In fact, I stood under one such, one such air intake vent, one air cleaning vent, with a small piece of paper, held it above my head, and just gave it a gentle flick. It was gone. It was in the system. Bottom line is what agent did evaporate, and some sarin certainly did evaporate. That agent was very quickly being pulled out of the air in the newer stations in Tokyo and being pumped out through the exhaust system. Now, there's two corollaries to that. First of all, the Hibiya line, the oldest subway line in use in Tokyo, does not enjoy the benefit of these lovely, new, large, very well-ventilated stations. These are old, long, narrow tubes with one big fan, exhaust fan, in the middle. Remember, these were the stations where 300 and 400 people were being taken out of the stations for treatment. Very high casualties in those stations. Secondly, whereas none of the first responders that went into the Tokyo subway system were themselves overcome by chemicals. Most of them were wearing protective gear. They went in, they got in, they got out. No harm done. The chief in charge of one of the fire response units who came to Kasumigaseki Station, who had not been privy to the briefings to the tabletop exercises the week before on what to do in a chemical situation, made a rather poor choice. He set up his command post next to one of the large exhaust vents right there at Kasumigaseki. And about 30 of his men and himself were overcome by sarin fumes coming out of the vent. None fatally, but they were overcome and needed re really required treatment as well. Omen experience, their lack of understanding of what they were doing, the fact that they weren't able to keep Satyan 7 running, the fact that they were not able to come up with a more effective means of dispersal, and frankly our own good luck, all of these things combined, I think, to produce that relatively low number of fatalities. From a counterterrorism point of view, there are a number of thoughts to keep in mind here. First of all, virtually everything the cult did in Japan, in terms of its chemical and biological activities, virtually everything it did was legal. 
at the time that they were doing it. There was no law against making chemical weapons. There's no law in Japan now against making biological weapons. They possibly were in violation of some environmental laws associated with the establishment of that chemical plant, the one that was hidden. But their activities themselves were perfectly legitimate, at least in the eyes of the law. They shopped for weapons technologies all around the world. They had, a, they had teams that crisscrossed this country, as well as Russia, as well as Europe and Japan, looking for, finding, and buying books, manuals, software, hardware, you name it. At the time that raids were carried out on cult facilities, they had chemical weapons manuals from both the US and Russian armies. The fact that the cult was in bed with the Russians, or the Rus certain Russians were in bed with the cult, does not appear to have significantly affected their WMD efforts. They certainly had a lot of relationships over there. They certainly were involved, for example, cult members did go to Spesnaz bases in Russia to receive hand-to-hand -hand and small arms training. But they do not appear to have received any specific assistance on WMD from the Russian government, or from, from their Russian contacts. The Tokyo attack, I think I've shown, was preventable. It didn't happen without warning. To the contrary, it culminated a series of events, a series of warnings, if you will, that were there for people to detect. And in fact, it's very clear to me that the Japanese knew of the danger long before the attack took place. There's every reason, I think, to believe that the authorities knew from, the, from late summer of 1994 that Om Shinrikyo was responsible for the attacks. There were a number of factors, however, that delayed their investigation to the point that it created the possibility of the Tokyo subway attack. First of all, you have to recognize that Japanese law enforcement operates differently than American law enforcement. In Japan, the police completely build their case, or they get their case to about the 98% level before they make an arrest. Here in the United States, law enforcement agencies are able to operate on probable cause and they can do a lot of their case building after they've made their arrests. So the Japanese tend to take their time building their case, working very, very methodically, and from our point of view, frequently very, very slowly. Secondly, Om Shinrikyo did enjoy a number of protections, both legal and societal, that gave them an additional level of protection. They did enjoy enhanced protections under freedom of religion. It is very difficult to get a search warrant to go into a religious, a religion-owned, or a, a, a church-owned facility. Very difficult indeed. Furthermore, the Japanese authorities do not like to use informants. They don't like to use wiretaps. They find both of those somehow distasteful and dishonorable. Though again, there are evidence, there's evidence here that they did use both in this instance. It's worth noting that when the Japanese finally carried out their raids against the Om Shinrikyo facilities at, Kasumagas, at uh, Kamakuishiki and other places, they did not do it on the authority of an investigation into the subway attacks, despite the fact that they were wearing that chemical gear. They didn't do it based on an investigation into the Matsumoto incident, despite the fact that they had that chemical protective gear. They raided the cult facilities because they were investigating a kidnapping and murder that had happened the year before. Om Shinrikyo had acquired some enemies. The parents of some of the, of some of the young people who had been lured into the cult had, reached, had, had been very unhappy over what they saw as brainwashing. So they hired an attorney to look into this matter, to challenge them, to get their children back. And this attorney was actually doing a pretty good job. He was getting publicity. He was carrying out a frontal attack, which, by the way, is also very un-Japanese. And he had become a genuine thorn in the, in the cult's side. Shoko Asahara determined that this man was a problem that he needed to be removed. And so he directed a team to go to this man's home, to go to this man's hometown, this lawyer, and to kill him. And so the team in classic Om Shinrikyo fashion, went to the train station. They decided that they would ambush, ambush him. They would wait for him to come home from his job in the city on the train that night. They would seize him, take him away, and kill him. And so they went to the station. And they waited. 
and they waited, and they waited, until one of the leading lights in that team suddenly realized that it was Sunday, and he was not going to be coming home that night. Well, once again, now here we have the classic conundrum. Do we go back and tell the boss that we messed up and didn't carry out his orders, or do we improvise? And unfortunately, this is one of those howevers that has a rather macabre turn to it. They decided to improvise. They found where he lived. They went to his home in the dead of night. They broke into his home, and while they held him down, first they killed his infant son, and then they killed his wife, then they killed him. They took the bodies back to Kamakushiki, they put the bodies into industrial scale microwave ovens, they burned off all of the meat, all of the skin, all the fleshy tissue, the organs. All they were left with were the charred bones. They then dismembered the skeletons and dumped them in a nearby lake. That was the crime that the authorities were authorized to investigate on those raids that began in March of 95 after the subway attack. See, the cult was a not an unknown quantity. And in fact, intelligence services around the world, including our own, should have been well aware of the danger that they posed. Certainly, they should have been well aware of the fact that there was a threat associated with chemical weapons. And yet, both the FBI and the CIA were forced to testify before the Senate in the fall of 95 that, hey, these guys were not on our radar screen. And I had a conversation with a guy who was, I guess, the third. He told me he was the third commercial attaché to the embassy in Tokyo. I guess that's what he was. He told me about sending a number of reports and cables and faxes back to Washington and back to Langley, Virginia. I don't know why describing what was going on in Tokyo in detail. This was, remember, a front page story in Japan. Apparently what happened was all this information was coming in, and someone at some level determined that it was very interesting and that we should put it in this, in this cubbyhole over here and wait for the Japanese to brief us in. Whoever that someone was, it didn't dawn on him apparently that this matter, remember the Australian experience, this matter was of such face, such a, such a matter of face, that that briefing would never come. And so it was that we were not aware of what happened prior to the subway attack, and we were caught by surprise when it did occur. For today, most of the cult leaders are in jail. They are on trial. Shoko Asahara is on trial, as are most of the others. Uh, there are still three members of the cult who were involved in the attack that are considered fugitives. And in Japan today, you can still see wanted posters on, on ver in various media in Japan. <coughs> Cult's Russian operations were ended by legal action. Assets were frozen. No doubt have been distributed among the boys by now. Um, it's worth noting that Asahara, I said before, he's on trial. On trial for his life in Japan. This is a capital crime. His trial's been going on for about two and a half years now. It's estimated that it's going to wrap up fairly quickly, maybe within the next four or five years, which by Japanese standards is pretty fast, actually. Um, he's had the, uh, very, the very bad form considered very bad form in Japan not to confess when you're arrested. He has chosen not to confess, which is why the trial will drag on. The cult lost its legal status as a church, and that's significant in Japan. That means it no longer has those legal protections. It is in bankruptcy. But some of the assets of the cult are unaccounted for. In fact, there are reports of millions of dollars moving offshore in the days after the subway attack. And it may be worth noting that there are current efforts underway to resurrect Om Shinrikyo. I mentioned before that Joyu-san, the, the, uh, the, uh, the boyish leader, is coming out within the next six months. He hopes to pick up the reins. The cult is once again selling computers in downtown Tokyo in three stores that they own and operate. And they are once again holding conferences, inviting people to come spend two or $3,000 to listen to videotapes of Asahara's teachings. Lesson for tomorrow, Tokyo obliterated a taboo that had already been shaken by events in the Gulf and elsewhere. The notion of using chemical or biological weapons has certainly been demonstrated. Terrorists, criminals, individuals are no longer hamstrung by the notion that it's never been done before. To the contrary, now it has. People are going to learn the lessons of Tokyo. They're going to see the mistakes that were made. It doesn't take, hard, it doesn't take much effort to find them. They may make other mistakes, but they're not going to make the same ones. Therefore, I think the next uses of these weapons will be far more devastating than those that went before. This is the kind of thing that could happen anywhere, and it will happen somewhere. In fact, it's already happening. Since March 1995, there have been a number of WMD events, either actual terrorist attacks or threatened terrorist attacks. Sydney, Australia, earlier this year, two chlorine bombs triggered in the center of the city. 
in, in Moscow about a year and a half, two years ago, Chechen separatists planted a, con a container with radioactive cesium in a park in the center of the city. They then notified the media first, then they notified the, the Russian government. Now, the cesium was relatively low grade, but the message was very, very clear. It could have been something else. In fact, there's roughly 1,000 cubic meters of medium to high grade radioactive material reportedly missing in Chechnya. The Patriots Council, a group of, of anti-government extremists in Minnesota, busted by the FBI, they possessed a biological toxin called ricin. Again, in the neighborhood of about 1,000 times more lethal than sarin. They were going to kill law enforcement officers and IRS agents. In New Delhi, India, about a year and a half ago, 40 people sat down for dinner. They didn't get up. There was a very fast-acting toxin that had been laced into their food supply, into their, into their food in the restaurant. And then, um, about two years ago, a white supremacist in Ohio, a guy by the name of Larry Wayne Harris, ordered and received bubonic plague. He ordered it via Federal Express. He popped up again earlier this year when the FBI arrested him out in, out in uh, Nevada when he was allegedly carrying out experiments with, a, with an anthrax vaccine. Now, the suggestion was that he might have been doing something else. The suspicions, the fears, were that he was actually going to test anthrax against some targets out there. That does not appear to have been the case, though it is clear that he was running around and he was being bankrolled by at least one uh, individual with some rather profound survivalist orientation. And in fact, I think that maybe the best way to close this out because of his notoriety, is maybe to let Larry Wayne Harris have the last word. What could you get right tomorrow, if you wanted? Anthrax. It would take me a few more days to get some cholera. It would take me maybe a few more days to get some plague. It's easy. Let's let that be the final word. Any questions I can take? Uh, you mentioned Joya's son, the guy that you said Hi. may have been the deep throat. But you also said he's coming out of prison, and he may be uh, reconnecting with the cult. Um, remember, the authorities do not tend to use uh, informants, so if he was one, it was, it was an atypical instance. Uh, but again, the fact that he got a very light sentence, considering his place in the hierarchy, is, is interesting. The fact is, he's about the only charismatic figure out there that, that, uh, that cult members may be willing to rally around. So I think that they may be able to take him by default. Also, there is no real indication that the cult... Uh, as it now is, is, what's left of it, is really interested in getting back in the, uh, in the government overthrow business. Uh, it may be very much that, uh, that the people trying to reconstitute it are interested in it more because it's an excellent business venture than, uh, than, than because they're looking at, at conquering the world again. Prior to the attack, did the uh, Om Shin Rigo, uh, did the Om group uh, align themselves with other organizations that uh, tried to overthrow the Japanese government, like the Japanese Red Army, for example? There's no indications of Ohm having been involved with, uh, with other, um, other revolutionary groups or organizations of that kind. Um, on the other hand, the cult does clearly appear to have had ties or connections with other, um, other um, extreme religious organizations. For example, um, several, several key lieutenants of Asahara's were formerly middle managers within the, uh, a group known as Soko Gakkai which is a very prominent um, uh, Buddhist organization in Japan with very good co government connections. Uh, there appear to have been some links to the, uh, to the, uh, um, uh, to the Moonies uh, as a group, possibly even some transfers of, of money or expertise at one point or another. The cult also appears to clearly have had some sort of business links or relationships with parties in North Korea. Uh, in fact, there was, uh, there was back and forth traffic between Japan and North Korea um, by cult members at various points, as well as with Russia. Um, there was a great deal of speculation in Japan, a lot of people hoping that they could tie Om Shinrikyo to some foreign power or some other conspiracy, and that, uh, that has not happened, but there are a lot of, a lot of suggestive elements out there. Yes, sir. One of the things uh, I noticed in the picture that you showed, uh, you know, the first responders, the emergency medical technicians around the people there at the subway, uh, none of them seem to have any personal protective equipment. Uh, have the Japanese instituted any uh, lessons learned as a result of this uh, for their first responders? Uh, the Japanese have, uh, have clearly come a long way, as we all have, since the, uh, since the Tokyo attack. I mean, remember, 
This was a, this was a, uh, a, a first time event. Well, okay, it was a second time event for, for the Japanese. Uh, but they responded to it as they would to a typical hazardous material incident. Again, the responders that went into the subway were wearing protective equipment. Uh, they were extracting victims, pulling them out. In the open air, they were being treated. Uh, but you're right, they were not wearing a great deal in the way of personal protective equipment on the surface. Uh, it, was dealt, it was primarily viewed as a subsurface issue. There has been training, there has been uh, investment in equipment. Um, you know, just as we in this country have started devoting efforts to, to trying to prepare for that kind of an event, certainly in Japan they've taken it fairly seriously as well. Were there any people uh, actually contaminated as a result of folks who, you said 90% of the folks transported themselves to the hospital? Interestingly yeah. enough, in Tokyo, uh, no. Uh, there, were no, there are no reports of any, any significant secondary contamination from, from victims there. Um, primarily, again, I think this goes to the fact that the sarin used in Tokyo was primarily in its liquid form. So those people who did get any kind of contact were, uh, or secondary exposure were people who came into contact with things like clothing that had absorbed some agent. But that wasn't, there wasn't much of that. In Matsumoto, however, the year before, uh, where you had a release of high-grade sarin in an aerosol form, you did have contamination of medical personnel and facilities. You had three, there were three hospitals in Matsumoto that handled victims. And in two of those hospitals, um, there were a number of nurses and, and doctors in the emergency room who themselves con became contaminated in dealing with victims as they were brought in. So there was off-gassing in that case. Yes, sir. Of the uh, injured but not uh, killed, any data on what percentage of that was, was actually sarin versus uh, panic and heart attacks? And the, 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 the 3,796 is, uh, is the number that is attributed to sarin exposure. Uh, there were, again, another uh, about, uh, about 1,700 who were, who've been taken from that list because their symptoms were uh, hysterical or they injured themselves in other ways and trying to get away, sprained ankles, what have you. Uh, but the 3796 appears to be sarin related. Yes, sir. Yes, ma'am. One of your bullets was that the um, attack in the Tokyo subway was preventable. Yes. But you also described how slow and methodical the Japanese system of justice is. Um, you know, given that they'd investigated the group and they thought they were going to do something, what else could they have done? Well, you, you've sort of got me on that one. Let me, let me say this. Um, you, can make, you can make a perfectly valid case uh, that the Tokyo subway attack would have been much, much worse if the authorities had not moved as they did. That if the cult had had time to build up its stockpile of agents uh, and carry out a full-blown attack against the government authorities or carried out a series of other events with, with a well-developed strategic plan, that the number of fatalities, the effects could have been much more, much more horrific. And that's absolutely true. Um, that notwithstanding, one of the barriers to the authorities moving as rapidly as they did was the high likelihood that the cult enjoyed some, some rather sophisticated political protection as well. Uh, for example, it's not coincidental, I don't think, that three key members of the, of the ruling party in Japan resigned within 48 hours of the Tokyo subway attack. One of them had been involved, for example, in opening the doors to Moscow for Aum Shinrikyo several years before. Um, the cult enjoyed some friends. Uh, the, cult, uh, the cult was able to take advantage of some chinks in the existing structure. Uh, but when I say that the attack was preventable, it seems to me fairly clear that if the notion if, it, if the notion of, of the group's ability to organize and carry out an attack in the way in which they did had been better appreciated, that the authorities could have moved with greater dispatch, um, perhaps could have, pre could have moved, maybe could have moved on Friday night instead of waiting until Monday morning, instead of waiting for the weekend to roll through. And I, I think the other lesson from that is that the precursor events were not strictly events that should have been noticed only in Japan. Uh, if there had been an international hue and cry over what was clearly an unprecedented event in Matsumoto, an actual use of weapons of mass destruction by terrorists, rather than getting a two-line squib in the International Herald Tribune and no notice whatsoever in the major journals in the United States or in Europe, then you might have seen some greater pressure for some action sooner. Yes, sir. Um, I've got a follow-up on that. Is, you know, if we have our intelligence assets internationally sending information back to Washington, and maybe you can't answer this question. Uh, do we have processes in place now to proactively affect timely response 
uh, given our forces overseas. You know, it, this very well could have happened to our Yokota Air Base or whatever. So uh, maybe just to raise a notion, I don't know if you want to entertain that question. Well, you know, there are there are reports that uh, that during their uh, their escapades with biological weapons, they drove around and visited, um, uh, for example, U.S. Uh, U.S. naval base in Japan and other U.S. facilities. U.S., for example, was on their hit list of targets. Um, the uh, I can answer that to this extent. Uh, there's no question that there is a greater focus now within the intelligence community on looking at the WMD threat. Um, to some extent, we may have swung too far the other way. You know, we now have a tremendously large center focusing on WMD and terrorism within the Central Intelligence Agency. Um, uh, at one point, they were looking at phasing it out. Instead, they decided to double it in size. Um, it may be, in fact, that we are now, uh, we're now being maybe almost too indiscriminate in our, in our assignment of, of threats to, to intelligence we get. But it's not clear to me at this point yet that we really have developed the kinds of filters that we need to sift through the, the unbelievable quantities of intelligence that we receive uh, and really do a good job of parsing it and identifying where the threats are. I think there are, there are men and women who are trying to get there. I think there's a commitment to get there. But I'm not sure yet that we have, uh, that we've managed to find the, uh, the, the holy grail for solving that problem. One more question and then we need to go. Okay. Okay. Your, your assessment of the Tokyo subway as a potential location for an attack was, was right on target. In an urban setting, what, what are some other potential areas uh, where a, a terrorist might be successful? Well, obviously, you know, to, for, for a terrorist, from a terrorist point of view, you want to attack the soft targets. Uh, and of course, the beauty of the beauty of uh, of saying that well, the subway is vulnerable. Let's protect the subway means that by definition, you're leaving a department store open, or a school open, or a coliseum open, or or an open air shopping market, or or any of a number of targets. Uh, I think again, you go back to the criteria: um, dense target population, uh, controlled environment, or reasonably controlled environment an opportunity to take advantage of confined space to maximize the punch when you're talking about chemicals. Um, once you've got that, then, uh, then you, can, you can put together a, a shopping list and you can get long in a hurry. Ladies and gentlemen, I thank you very much for your attention today. And also, I thank you for being willing to be out there on the front line for those of us who, who have to sit back here and just talk about things. Thank you very much.